Thank you very much. How many of you are anxious about the future? Maybe you're worried about climate or the economy or getting a job after you graduate. Well, happily, I am here <laughs> because I am a doctor. That's right, I am a doctor of theater, <laughs> which I realize is a little bit like saying I'm a doctor of silly putty or perhaps that I have my PhD in playing dress up and make believe. Which actually I do have my PhD in playing uh, dress up and make believe. Um, but nevertheless, I can alleviate your symptoms because I can predict the future. I use theater to predict the future. For example, before I even got up on this stage, I predicted that you would have some skepticism right now. Skepticism, I, as I foresaw it. But it's okay, I didn't actually foresee the skepticism because I'm, you know, clairvoyant or something. I actually saw it because it's part of a longer history of theater. A history that has a name, a symptom, if you will. Remember, I'm a doctor. A <laughs> symptom called the anti-theatrical prejudice. And this prejudice goes back over 2,500 years. And it's resulted in the fact that, that many of TED Talks about theater feel that they first need to start by defending why theater is important. And they usually have one of three ways that they do this. The first is to talk about theater as an economic good. Right? And people will talk about how theater returns revenue to its environment, right, to its community. How for every dollar that we invest in a theater community, it generates six in the local economy through restaurants and bars and parking. Right? That's an important thing. Uh, Americans for the Arts, an advocacy group, talks about theater and how it contributes over $7.1 billion to the American economy and employs upwards of one, uh, 100 to 120 million uh, employees in the United States every year. That's important. Right? The second argument they make is that theater as a cultural good. And this is like uh, intellectual broccoli. Right? It's good for you. Right? It clears out your system. It builds empathy and introduces you to new ideas and new people and other cultures and perhaps even yourself. And it's, it's really good for these reasons. The third, and this will be especially important for those of us here at Bowdoin College, is theater as the common good, right? As a kind of social benefit. And this is about theaters that happen in, in programs in prisons or schools or that help marginalized and disenfranchised communities find their voice and build it up and share it more, more broadly, right? Also a very important idea. But I'm not gonna talk about any of these. I'm not gonna talk about theater and its importance to the economy, or theater as an essential element of culture, or even theater as a shared social experience. I'm gonna encourage you to be much more individualist and self-serving, because I'm going to tell you how to use theater to tell the future. Now, it occurred to me in doing this that I would tell you the future, but you probably wouldn't believe me because, I mean, again, I have my PhD in dress up and make believe. So I thought, first, I have to establish a persona that you can buy into, right? I have to combat the anti theatrical prejudice. So today, don't think of me as a PhD in dress up. I am a theoretical theaterist. That's right, that's right. And what, you might ask, is a theoretical theorist? Well, it's a little bit similar to a, a theoretical physicist, right? A theoretical physicist understands, analyzes, explains, and predicts natural phenomena using mathematical models and abstractions. <laughs> it suddenly became interactive. <laughs> Theoretically, that's what a theoretical physicist does, <laughs> according to some sources. Maybe not those here. A theoretical theorist, regardless, also uses models and abstractions to analyze, understand, explain, and predict artificial phenomena, those that humans create socially and among themselves. Now, again, I thought, you know, I'm not going to convince you of this just by telling you what's going to happen in the future because, you know, you might believe me, you might not, but by the time we leave here, who knows, right? It hasn't happened yet. It's the future. So I thought, okay, 
tell you what, I'm going to go back in time and I'm going to tell you when theorists of the past accurately predicted the future. For example, in 1896, a French playwright predicted that one day a completely unpredictable, flamboyant, corrupt, and potentially crazy man would suddenly become the ruler of a country. I'm obviously thinking of Silvio Berlusconi of Italy. <laughs> the play was Ubu the King by Alfred Jarry in 1896. In 1938, another playwright predicted, even though over the course of her lifetime she had gone from oil lamps and candles as a form of illumination to the electric light, she predicted, predicted that one day everything would be bathed in electricity that we would have so much light that light is not bright. This is what Gertrude Stein wrote in Dr. Faust's Lights the Lights in 1938. But the good one, the one I've been holding, is from 1958. And this is a play in which an Irish playwright predicted that one day in the future, and in fact the opening line of the play is one evening in the future, that one day in the future people would have small mobile recording devices. And they would love these small little mobile recording devices. And they would talk to them incessantly. And they would record their thoughts and their dreams and their love and their fears. And then they might even prefer to talk to the small little recording devices more than they preferred to talk to other people. That they would use them as a way of keeping their memories and recording what happened to them. And that they would play back these recordings as a way of understanding themselves and the world. This is a play from 1958 called Crap's Last Tape by Samuel Beckett. And if you read Crap's Last Tape, you will see that it is surprisingly similar to the way we interact with many, many of us, at least, interact with our mobile phones today. He predicts a certain kind of technological comfort and, so, and, so, and solidarity as opposed to a social comfort and solidarity. So that's what theorists have said about our future in the past. So if we believe that they had some insight, what are the theorists saying today? This is not so happy. And maybe will not relieve your anxiety so much. Because Carol Churchill in a play, British playwright, from, in a play called Far Away from 2000, predicts that in the future, all of the world will be engaged in truly global conflict. Not just national identities and different identitarian groups, right? It's not just the, the Chinese opposed to the French or the Americans versus the Russians. No, 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 no. She predicts that all of the world's entities will engage in global conflict. The deer going over to the side of the alligators and the children under five. Water siding with rocks and earth against air. At the end of that play, she asks, who owns silence? on whose side is darkness. That's really not a good way to relieve your anxiety, is it? I didn't say I was a good doctor. So let me give you one other more uh, uplifting and optimistic prediction. In a 2012 play, the American playwright Anne Washburn wrote a play called Mr. Burns, in which this is sort of like the, uh, the follow-up to Stein's Dr. Faustus Lights the Lights. And in Mr. Burns, Anne Washburn foresees a future event of a global scale in which all electricity has been wiped off the planet. Right? It's the end of all electric media and technology that we have today. All the lights, all the computers, all the wires, right? Done. So what happens? Well, according to Washburn, what, it, what society does is that it has to reconstitute its myths. It has to find a common language and a common environment in which to operate. And it resuscitates culture, human culture, from the most ubiquitous story that she can think of, The Simpsons. <laughs> the longest running television show in, in US and, and probably global history. Right? And that, that in the future, humanity will draw from The Simpsons as a way of understanding itself and will continue. And that, in fact, absent media, absent recordings, that theater will become the new media. And it will become that by remediating the old media, by turning TV into theater. 
which I have to say, with my PhD in dress up and make believe, I find kind of an optimistic future, right? Because that means that theater is the future. And that kind of makes me happy. But there's one more lesson that I want you to take away from this, right? As you look to predict the future. So if you want to understand what's happening, to happening tomorrow, you don't necessarily need to look at history. And you don't necessarily need to be a theoretical physicist. Right? You can look at what, is, what are the theorists of today predicting. How are they imagining it? Because unlike science fiction writers, theorists have to make stuff out, uh, make their work out of the stuff of the everyday, out of human bodies and physical objects. And they don't just render them in language or two-dimensional spaces. They have to create whole three-dimensional worlds. These are the models. These are the abstractions. So the lesson for us today, I think, is very clear. To survive in the future, we need to play more in the present and take a theater class. <laughs> Thank you very much.